Sunday, we're in Book of James, first chapter 14, 15. We've been in a study out of James, starting with verse 12, on different forms of temptation test, te, or, or te, testings by God, by Satan, and now by the lust of our sin nature, which we are now will conclude today, if I can find James 1. I'll find it here in a minute. We're in verses 14 and 15 with it today. And here's what the writer James says. But each one is tempted. That's been his subject in verse 13. But each one is tempted when he's carried away, enticed by his own lust. And when lust has conceived, that's the idea of pregnancy. It gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished or reached its deadline, it brings forth death. And we call that temporal death in theology, which we'll talk about today as well. Let's open with prayer. I give you a moment as believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit because of the church age. Galatians 3, 2. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit enters your life and does eight works, of which one is indwell you. And there is your life as spirituality. Spirituality is the life of the Holy Spirit, third member of the Godhead, actively engaged within your personal life because of your volition. And volition is important as we come to the study tonight because you can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality would be personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue or overt sins. Classroom etiquette requires confession of that sin in order to be under the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit because he is the teacher of truth. It is truth that sets you free from the cosmic system and it's a very important etiquette to Bible study. Not only is this principle important for Bible study, that is the inhale of Bible doctrine, but the exhale of it as well under the principle of walk by faith, under the ministry of walk by the Spirit. So it's a very important principle. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, again, it's personal sin. As I mentioned, it could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. You should do that in privacy. You should do it all the time when you're aware of personal sin, not just when you come to church and not when you just study the Bible. But it's an exercise that's important because our life is to be spiritual. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. So I give you a moment. We're thankful, Father, to understanding how this principle works under the new covenant of the church age. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this study today out of James 1, 14 and 15 into our life because it is the key to the Christian life under the new covenant. And that is the dynamic ministry, the supernatural ministry of the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, indwelling every, every church-age believer. It is important that we take advantage of that during this dispensational stay on earth to have the great ministry that God has prepared for the church. A great mystery in the Bible of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. But here we are, Father, living it out in the reality of our life. And I pray today this, story, this message that will come to us will show us the dynamics of how not to give in to the lust of the flesh, how to walk in the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have been in this discussion on the testing of the lust of the sin nature. This is our second lesson on this study in itself. <clears throat> We're going to look at four ideas or four aspects of lust giving, way, giving birth to sin. Notice in this passage, this is lust giving birth to sin and sin giving birth to death. That's very important. It's very important we understand what the writer is trying to tell us because it is the dynamics of the Christian life. Here's point number one. It's important that every church age believer understands that temptation to sin by his own lust of his sin nature is not personal sin. It is not a sin to be tempted to sin. That's not a sin. It's not a sin to be tested. That's just why you're a human being, born again person. Now, you, if you, you had that in you before you got saved, 
but you didn't have a power to not. You had willpower, but how good is that on a second piece of pie? Right? So much for that. So we know that the, some things that we're not lustful over, we can say no to in our minds, and willpower wins. But in those areas of our life, and there are trends in areas where we, we're, we're not able, then we surrender to it, and then we result. But as a believer, unbelievers don't have an inner power. Because the inner power that has control over the sin nature and every lust of the sin nature is the Holy Spirit of God. It's the only power you have. It's the only true power you have to really conquer it. And so that's really important. And it conquers everyone every time. Conquers everyone every time. But being tempted to sin is not, is not a sin. And so it's important you understand that because a lot of Christians don't know that. And they beat themselves all, up all the time because they, they, they are tempted through their sin nature. Listen, how do I know I have a sin nature? Yes. See that flesh? You got flesh? Then you have a sin nature. That, that's what sark means. The, the word sin nature comes from the word sark. It's most of the time is used as flesh because you get it at birth and you have it till death. Just because you got saved don't, doesn't mean you still don't have the sin nature, but the power over your life has been broken through salvation, and now you have the Holy Spirit to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you what I mean. Back up here to the book of Galatians a moment. We're looking at the fifth chapter of Galatians. We're looking at verse 16. You should become very familiar with this verse. This verse will save your bacon. You know what I say when I say that? This verse will save your bacon more times than you can imagine. Verse 16. I mean, Galatians 5, 16. But I say, walk. That's peripateo. Walk by the Holy Spirit, by means of the Holy, that is the indwelling Holy Spirit of Galatians 3, 2, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. He says, walk by means of the Holy Spirit, that's the one who lives in you, notice that's capital S, and you will not carry out the desires or the lust of the flesh, that's your sin nature. You, what's it say? You will not. And I don't care which area it's in. It can be in the area of your vulnerability. The one area of your life or the two areas of your life you always gave in to, you don't have to give in to anymore. But I tell you, if you think it's by willpower or my will, will the, the will overcomes the flesh, mm -mm. no, it's by surrendering your flesh to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, he lives there and is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's the third member of the person of the God head. So if I walk in the spirit, I will not fulfill the, desire, the lust of the flesh. So that's a very strong and important principle for your life. You don't have to give in to it, but you do have to give in to the Holy Spirit. You can't give in to the lust of the flesh or it'll become sin, Right? So when that temptation comes, what should you do? You should go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You know when you're being tempted to sin, either mentally or verbally or overtly. And as soon as that, you, and you go into inner dialogue, you always discuss this stuff with yourself first. And you may be the only person you ever discuss it with because everybody else will go like, <gasps> Stop doing that. You have the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit that connects you with him all the time. When you go to that inner dialogue, immediately, it's okay to go to inner dialogue. You are who you are. But as soon as you go to inner dialogue, go right to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Let's go to Romans. 13th chapter of Romans. Go to Romans with me. 13th chapter, verse 14. I want you to put your eyes on this. 
Here's that inner dialogue. Because, listen, the inner dialogue, as soon as you're being tempted, you go, you're into inner dialogue. Unless you're brain dead. Now listen to what he says. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what your Bible says? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you know who, who is he addressing? You, right? How are you going to do that? I'm going to go right there. I'm going to put him on. Oh, can I talk to Jesus? This guy's driving me crazy I'm with. Yeah, but you're with yourself. I know. That's what I'm telling you. Why not make that call? You're already on a line. Hang up and call him. Because who you're talking to is full. <laughs> He's going to get you in trouble. Has he gotten you in trouble in the past? Come on. Other than your willpower. How good is that? Well, it's only in areas that you're not vulnerable to. So he's put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of talking to yourself, talk to somebody who's got some good sense. Hang up. Hang up and call Jesus. Is that hard to think that way? Well, get in it. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision. That's an interesting word. I'll talk about it later, but I'll give you a heads up on it. It's pronoia. You know what it means? Forethought. It means forethought. You know what forethought is? It's trying to figure out some way to get that thing done. James is going to call it carried away and enticed. He's going to call it carried away and enticed. Paul called it forethought. Make no provision. Make no provision. When you get it, who, where do you think you are when you're into forethought? You're into yourself. <laughs> Hang up. Hang up and call Jesus. Make no provisions for the flesh, sin nature, in regard to its what? Lust. Forethought for lust, gratification, or fulfillment. Wherever the devil is pushing you will be destructive. It is always destructive in the end. Oh, come, let's go for a joy ride. By the time, then an ambulance picks you up and takes you on life support. There's your joy ride. It is important to understand that temptation. To sin by lust is not a personal sin, but it's a red flag. Huh? I'm going to tell you what I'm telling you today is a life changer as a Christian. It will be a life changer as a Christian. It was for me. It changed my life dramatically. My first, my first dramatic change was getting saved. My second, the second major change, the thing that still dominates my life today was what God taught me, what I'm teaching you. It changed my life dramatically when I understand that I had, didn't have to be a slave any longer to my sin nature or lust. If you think you don't have a sin nature, 1 John 1, 8 says, you've made him a liar. Because you have one. How do I know? You got flesh? Still got flesh? Worms hadn't eaten it yet, had he? You still got flesh? Still alive? Well, this is what he's talking about. It's exactly what he's talking about. But I'm going to tell you, when you... When you get on the phone with yourself about what's going on, you're in, a you're in danger. Hang up and call Jesus. Ask him what he thinks. What's the Bible say? It's a red flag warning of carnality. Listen to this. This is a great passage, by the way. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Watch this now. 
And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people. In other words, people who are who have conquered the sin nature are ready to go on to the spiritual maturity. You'll never get to spiritual maturity until you learn how to conquer your, your sin nature. You'll never get there. There's two people that stay. The, the baby stays because he can't believe in the security of his salvation. He stays there. The immature believer stays there because they don't know how to win over the flesh. He stays immature. He's immature all of his life. These people never grow. They never, never grow, and they live in guilt and shame and fear all their lives. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. Why do I care? Everybody's a whiner, not a diner. They'll never get into the Word of God. They'll never get deep into the Word of God. They'd, set, they'd rather sit around and whine and feel bad about themselves. They don't have a prayer life, don't have a ministry, they have nothing going in their life. If you would talk to them and they would be serious about it, they'd say, my life sucks. We know what that means. We hear it a lot from people. How's that possible? Christ dies on the cross, gives you everything. He, he, they, listen, bankrupts heaven to give you everything, and, and you can't make it through the day? You live in this depressed state of mind? You know what's happened to you? Your flesh. Your carnal. I'm telling you today how to come out of that mess. You don't have to take Valium. You just need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Instead of being depressed that depress others, be impressed that impress others. You talk too much to yourself and not enough to the Lord. I can tell you the guy who spends all the time talking to himself and being miserable is a person that doesn't know how to talk to the Lord. How is that possible? How is that possible? That you, Listen, why is it possible for you to remain at that state of existence? When God has provided you under grace operating assets, everything necessary to you, for you to have inner peace and joy and contentment in life. How is it possible? Because you talk to yourself too much and don't talk to the Lord enough. Now listen to me. Go back to my back here. I'll, I'll stop preaching at you. I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, notice this word, S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. In your Bible, if you looked at this, if you turned to your, you'll, you'll see that it's called fleshy. Not fleshly. It's called fleshy. It's got a Y, not an L-Y. Are, are you in 1 Corinthians 3? Well, if you had a Greek text, you would see that, 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 that word is going to end in a S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. And if you have a King James Bible, it's going to call it carnal. In fact, the King James is going to do something. He's going to call it carnal in verse 1 and carnal in verse 3. Am I right? If I remember right. And it is the same word, but in different forms. Both of these words, one is S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S, and one is S-A-K-R-I-K-O-S. Now, both of them have the same root, and that's sark, meaning flesh or sin nature. Are you with me? But there's a different slant on their meanings, right? Because one ends in N-I-N-O-S, and one ends in I-K-O-S in the Greek that's really important. That's why the writers clean that up. In the New American Standard Version, they clean that up and they call the first sark, the first one flesh, they called it fleshy, right? Come on. You got your Bibles open. I'm trying to tell you something that's really important. I, mean, I wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't important to my subject. Do you see it? Does it say fleshy? Is anything going to say fleshy? 
If you got a S N A S B, Eric's going to call it carnal. If you got a King James, okay, all right, good. Now, carnal, carnal is not a bad word. It means flesh. It's not a bad word. It's not a bad translation. But it's Latin. It's not Hebrew, not Greek. It's Latin, which is okay. Like Calvary, Calvary's Latin. There are a lot of words in, that we've got in the English that came from a Latin derivative of a, in, biblical influence, and that's okay, as long as you understand what the Greek says. So it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the, it's carnal, the word carnal, and, and there's a theology called carnality, all from that word out of Latin, not Greek. Now, the, the NOIS is, a moment is going to be important to you. Now, let, let me go back to the reading of it. He says, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, fleshy, as to babes, napias. See, he's talking about Christians who haven't learned to win over carnality to be spiritual on a consistent basis. Agreed? He's not talking to babies over here struggling on their conversion. You know, like First Peter 2, 2, newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. He's not talking to that group of people. They translate it babes, but they don't mean babes in that sense. That's brethos. He's talking about babes who are immature. They can't, they haven't learned how. To, and these are two victories you've got to win if you're going to become a spirit, if you're going to maintain spiritual growth maturity. You're not going to get in it. If you, if you're never going to get from a baby into immaturity unless you can win over the fear of whether I'm saved today and lost tomorrow, saved today, lost tomorrow. And the same thing here. If you don't know and if you don't learn how to win over your flesh so that you can win and stop, stop conversing with yourself about foolishness of life, hang up on yourself and talk to Jesus is my, my recommendation to you. You've got to win. When you get into a system a pattern of walking in the power of the Spirit and not in the power of the flesh, in the three categories we all always talk about, male attitude sins, sins of the tongue, and overt sins, once you begin to win that in a consistent basis in the power of God, you will go into spiritual maturity, and there's where the game is being played. You're off from the bench, and now you're a first stringer. You're a first stringer. You're not a first stringer. You're in reserve status because you can't hold it. One day you're up, the next day you're down. One day you're in, one day you're out. I don't care how many years you've been in church. I don't care how many years. I don't care if you're a pastor. I meet them all the time that don't know how to do this. You've got to learn. These are, these are the areas of warfare. You've got to win over this insecurity of your salvation. You've got to win over the flesh, and then you've got to win in the angelic conflict. That's a spiritual mature believer who is now headed to super grace and is going to hold that boat instead right on course until dying grace. You will never get there. I'm telling you, and listen, you'll get so beat up in immaturity, you won't have a desire to go there. You will shut down the whole program. Guilt and shame and remorse and all those things that go with not how, it, how to learn to conquer this stuff. There are a lot of people over here that are saved in their babies. There's a lot of people in the church that are here, they're immature. There are few people over here that are holding the ship on course to die in grace. Few. Even in a church that teaches heavy. This is about as heavy teaching a church as you'll find in Birmingham. As far as covering doctrine from point A to point B. You can see, you can look around and see the empty pews. This, this church only seats 250 people. And when we first moved here, we kept it full all the time. Maybe it's not that people aren't interested in knowing the word of God. Maybe we don't have a ministry to them. 
Maybe we've not reached out as a congregation to reach these people. I meet people almost every day. I'm just like you. I meet people every day. And they're interested in the word of God, but I can't get them to come. They won't leave foolishness. They're all hung up with some kind of foolishness over, over somewhere, and they won't come to sit and learn, although they, they want to learn. They tell me all the time, I want to learn, I want to learn, I want to learn. I said, well, that's not true. You're speaking lies to yourself because if you want to learn, you'd come. You'd give up not learning to learn, wouldn't you? I don't know. I did. I don't know. Now, I want, to, I want you to show something because my words are mixed up, so change these words. Look on the next line. The next line down there under point one is sarkikos. It's got a K, right? It should be, listen, it should be S-A-R-K-I-N-O-S. That's an N-O-S. It's descriptive of the sin nature because that's what, I, that's what I, I-N-O-S, that's, that, that suffix is very important in the Greek language. Because it's talking about, listen to me now, if you, if you look this up in uh, advanced Greek, they would tell you about suffix. Most people don't pay attention to them. They're just glad to know the alphabet. But this deals with the material, the, the substance, the material substance of something. The material substance of it. Ernie and I were talking the other day, and here's a guy that knows about wood and building and all that kind of stuff. And my deck was rotten out, and we couldn't figure it out. And, oh, Ernie figures out. Well, he says the lumber that was used on that back when it was done, uh, they didn't treat it properly. They didn't treat the lumber properly, and, th- and so it, it deteriorates. It, it doesn't hold like like the lumber today does, that's properly been properly treated to outlast all the elements. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the substance of material. That's I-N-O-S. And that's the word that, that and I had him back with that. That's the word that should be there is description of the sin nature and what it, what the, what it produces out there. Here's the substance. This is the substance of the material. The guy over here says, I got sin. You got, yeah, because you got a sin nature. What's the sin nature made up of? It's, it's made up of the lust of the flesh. How does it operate, lust of the flesh? Where did, where did that come from? came from Adam. I, I just taught that. You remember? The three eyes, the uh, imputation of sin, inherent. That's inherent sin. It's the sin nature and individual sin. Well, it describes the, the material, the substance of the material, while the S-A-R-K, Sark, I-K-O-S is, description, is a description of, of, of how, how it's used. The lust of the flesh. It's talking about the lust of the flesh. Here's what it's talking about. The lust of the flesh produces personal sin. And personal sin produces temporal death. The lust of the flesh, substance, where did that come from? How, how does that work? is now being used in a building, is now being used, the lust of the flesh is now being used to produce personal sin, which produces temporal death. That's what James is talking about. It's description of the sins. Now, it, back to Corinthians, back to Corinthians, you can see it. Because in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, you want to go back there for a moment? If you want to slide back there for a moment, because... I'm not going to get through my lesson anyhow. So we just might as well enjoy yourself till we can get a cup of coffee in a cup of coffee. And a donut. Look at verse 3. See, now we have, what we have is IKOS, fleshly. What we have is an IKOS on the end. Now we're talking about what belongs to it. What, 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 what's being produced from it. And you know what he shows you? He shows you personal sin. What's the two he showed you? 
Now, he, he's talking contextually about something, but he shows you two sins. What were they? Right? Did he show you two? Mine had two. Strife and jealousy. Right? I don't know. What does yours say? Is it close to strife and jealousy? Okay. <laughs> That's what I said, strife and jealousy. You know what they are? Tell me, tell me what, are they personal sins? Yeah. Mm, of course they are. In what category do they, do they float in? Strife and, yes, right? Strife and mental attitude sins and uh, jealousy, strife and jealousy, right? Strife, strife could be out there. Strife could be there, and it, it, it could even become physical, couldn't it? You know? No, you're not going to say that to me again. Uh, then, it would, then the strife would change to beating somebody up, wouldn't it? But anyhow, I, I just want to show you that. You see, in verse 1, I got I-N-O-S. But in verse 3, I got I-K-O-S. And, and they show you how, how these words are defined. Fleshy and fleshly. See that? It's just kind of good. Now, but each one is tempted. See the word tempted? That's spelt wrong. So change it. I didn't notice it until this morning. It should be P-E-I-R-A-Z-O. Okay? Parazzo. It's a word tempt or test. Each one is tempted. Watch this now. Watch this now. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed. That's why you got to hang up the phone and call Jesus. Because if you stay on the phone with yourself, this is where this baby's going. James says, here's the natural progression. If you don't hang up the phone, do, and listen to what he said, do not make any provisions, forethought, for where this should go. Make no provisions for the lust of the, fle- to the, lust of the sin nature. Hang the phone up. Talk to Jesus. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The only thing can calculate. See, that's being tempted. It's not sin, but it's being tempted. It's a red flag. Red flag goes up. What do I do? Hang up. Talk to Jesus. Go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What will conquer the... Listen, if I walk in the Spirit, I will not what? Fulfill the lust of the flesh. I will not. If I stay on the phone... And keep trying to rationalize this thing out. Try to walk this thing out on my own. I'm going to wind up. I'm, then I'm going to get carried away. I'm going to get into forethought. I'm going to get, I'm going to carry, I'm going to get carried away. I'm going to be enticed. Still not sin. But I'm, I'm under the flag, the red flag, the flagpole is bending over. You, you ever been to Florida and they put the red flag up? Is it a red flag or a yellow? No, it's a red, ain't it? Well, listen, not only is the flag blowing like crazy, but the flag pole is bending over. I don't think you want to go swimming. The waves are 100 feet tall. What's happened? I'm being carried away and enticed to what? To sin. You got to stop that baby. And listen. Listen. Catch it at the very start. It's, it's a lot easier. Once you get carried away and get enticed, now you're in big danger. You're in what we call the danger zone. What's next? Temptation, lust of the flesh. Carried away and enticed, forethought. Carried away and enticed, what's the next step? Sin. Temptation, not a sin. Carried away is not a sin. Right? Not a sin yet. It's over there. Setting in a quarter second of his thumb. It's not, it's not carried away. It's not enticed. We're still not there. But listen, the flagpole, not as the flag wave, but the flagpole is bending. (laughs) 
He is carried away. Notice that's a present passive participle. Working off the main verb, parazo. Each one is tempted. Uh, tempted. Carried away. Boy, this flight pole's going. Carried away and enticed. Notice those are present passive participles. What's carrying him? Lust of the sin nature. What's, what's enticing him? Lust of the sin nature. Can he stop it himself? No. The, the, the train is going to have a wreck. It's going to produce, it's on the fast track to where? Sin. And who's right? Who's the, who is the, who is the guy that's driving the train? Usen, usens, misen. The last guy that needs to be driving this train is you and me. Stop the train and get off. It's going to wreck. It's going to cause death. What's behind sin? Once you get into sin, what's the next step? Temporal death. So each one is tempted. I'm in verse 14. Each one is tempted when he's carried away. See, that's a present part of the main verb is that's the that's the that's the train. And, it, and who is it carrying? You. And who is he enticing? You. Tempted. You're being carried away and enticed by is hoople plus the ablative of means. That is allowing oneself in this inner dialogue, hang up the phone and talk to Jesus. Eventually, you're going to have to do this. Do it now before you get Waller in the muck and mire of the pig pen. Do it now so that you don't have to do it in the midst of a bunch of pigs trying to fight you for a little bit of scraps. Prodigal son or daughter. Allowing oneself, hoople plus the ablative, the word by, by means, means allowing oneself to be controlled or pushed along volitionally. You're into forethought. You're into planning or providing. You're a player. Get out of the game. You will lose this game every time. Carried away enticed of temptation is not yet sin. But the flagpole is not the flag that's waving. It's the flagpole. You're in a danger zone. You're in a very dangerous situation. The lust of the flag. It is. The, the Lord is trying to tell you in so many different ways. Shut it down. Shut it down. Shut it down. Shut it down. And listen, here's what you think. Oh, I'm going to I'm gonna not eat anymore, or I'm not going to live there anymore, or I'm not going to go to church there anymore, or I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm not going to do this anymore, and somehow that will solve it. That will solve it? Quit talking to yourself. Listen, what will solve the lust in your life over the sin nature is the same for every person in here, including myself. It is walking by the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the flesh. I'm just saying. Once you go with this and that, we're going to get blow through point one and then have a break. I'll come back next week. Ernie's got the second half. I want to hear what Ernie's got to say. I want you to go to Samuel. I want you to go to Samuel. Second Samuel. I want to show you something. Second Samuel, the 11th chapter. This is David and Bathsheba. Listen. David, a man after God's own heart.
pretty powerful idea. I'm down into verses, what, three, two and three. In verse one, here it is. It's the spring of the year, times when kings go out to battle. David sent Joab, the, the, his commander of the troops, went out to war. David stayed at Jerusalem. Look at verse two. Where should have David been? Where did, listen, I don't know. David should have been where God wanted him, but where did David think he should have been? In this, in verse one, where did David think he should be? Now, right? He felt he should be out with his men. Fighting the war for Israel, right? I'm not saying that was a right decision. I'm just saying that's what David felt, right? Because he lets us in. This is what David felt. This is what David felt. Now, he could have solved this and got this pretty simple. We wouldn't have verse 2 and 3 if he'd have stopped talking to David and started talking to the Lord about it. The Lord had given peace about it, wouldn't he? Can Joab handle it? Is there any reason you should be out and feel you are the king of the, all the people? Is there any reason why you... He could have talked all this out with the Lord and got to some kind of place of contentment because he's in the middle of night. He's walking the floor. We've all walked the floor in the middle of the night because we've got unresolved issues. I'm the only guy, right? You old poker players. Good thing I don't have any money. You'd have every whatever I bet I had. So here's the evening. You know, this is what's going on in David's mind. I ought to be out there. It's spring of the year. I ought to be out with my guys. No, not really. Joab can handle it. This is not that big a deal. Joab can handle it. We can. This is good. I, I need to. I need to do king's business. He should have got that all wrestled out with the Lord. He didn't because he's still in the inner dialogue. And it's not going well because here it is in the inner dialogue. And when evening came, David arose from his bed and started walking around on the roof of the king's house. It's in the middle of the night. David can't sleep. Something's got him up. I don't think it's bed bugs. Something's got him up. Verse one tells us what he's up for, right? What he has got resolved in his soul. It's not resolved in his soul. It's not resolved with whom? The Lord. This issue is not resolved with the Lord. He's up and he's walking. He's, and his mind's going crazy. We all have that. This is not bad. It's but unresolved. He should have went to the Lord in prayer. He should have wrestled it all out. Listen, he works for the Lord. He doesn't work for Israel. He's not king of Israel for no reason. He's been appointed by God Almighty. What kind of a king are you? Go to the one who rules the kings of Israel. Who do you think you are in the middle of the night wrestling with this stuff? Go to the one who is the chief over you. Go to the one who is your Lord and Savior over you and ration it out with him. But like so many of us, he don't do that. We think we're king, but you're king for a day. And it don't go good if it's not without Christ. So here where he is, he's walking around in Ruth in the middle of the night. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. So what? Not a problem with that. Depends on what you do with it, Dave. In our dialogue. He's wrestling with one thing, and all of a sudden, he's over here, and now he's in another ballgame. What's happened to, oh, I wonder how my troops are doing. I wonder how the the fight's going on the field. Oh, I see a girl bathing. So what? The flesh that was walking the floor is now walking the eyes. And the mind is set for it. This is temptation. So was the other, by the way. He wouldn't win that one either. 
He hasn't won the. He has a. He hasn't won verse one. He hasn't won the war of verse one. And now he's about to go into war two. He's about to get into war two. I wonder how he'll do. I wonder how Dave will do when he lost the first one. I wonder how he'll do with the second one. Can we not figure this one out? I wonder how he'll do with the third one. I wonder how he'll do with the fourth one. Listen, I could psychology. I could work psychology on this guy. David arose from a bed. He walked around the roof of the house. He looks off from the roof, sees a ba- woman bathing in the middle of the night. The woman was very beautiful in appearance. Shut it down, Dave. Shut it down. He can't because he's got one engine already riding that he hasn't shut down. So the second one is going to be easier than the first one. Shut it down, Dave. Oh, she's very beautiful. Shut it down, Dave. Got a wife, Dave? Uh-huh. How many you got? Well, I got a, I got a barn load. Isn't a barn load enough? Shut it down, Dave. Hang the phone up. Hang the phone up. Let's talk to Jesus. Let's get back to the primary discussion we started with. You haven't resolved it. Now we're on another one. So it is in the flesh. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Shut it down, Dave. Shut it down. Who has the power to shut it down? The guy who is being carried away and enticed by his lust. Shut it down. Stop walking in the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Dave, shut it. Hang up. Hang up, Dave. Hang up, Dave. Hang it up. Oh, they reported, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You know who her grandfather was? Do you know the house that she was at? While her husband was at war, commanding front troops, a war hero himself, and her father, a war hero, in the 33 honored men, heroes of Israel, these were two of the honored 33 famous 33 hero worship guys of the Israelite that David put the Medal of Honor on. These were men of great warrior integrity for the nation of Israel. They served their king with great loyalty. And the grandfather who was at the house where she was staying was David's right-hand administrator. He didn't talk about anything in Israel unless it went through a guy that was her grandfather, Hiphael. A Hiphael. This was the guy. And he's listening. In the power of the lust of the flesh, David threw all of them under the bus for sex. Three of the greatest men in David's administration, he threw under the bus for sex. And this is going to come back. I have told this story. I have taught it to you. This is going to come back to bite him so many times. I close with this. You can pound a nail in the wall. And you can pull it out. That's 1 John 1, 9. You can pound a nail of sin into your life. And you can confess it and God will pull that nail out. There's still a hole. There's a consequences that has to be reckoned with. And boy, did David have to ever reckon with it. And this story gets worse. Not only is he going to drive one nail in the wall, he's going to drive a bunch of them.
Next week, we'll go back to this story and we'll talk more about it. Listen, shut it down. You don't, uh, listen, temptation doesn't have to wind up sin and temporal death. Which could be a premature death. That's not what it means, but it could lead to it. Could lead to a sin unto death, which is worse than temporal. And I'll talk about it next week with you. My message to you today is the message that's to me. I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to us. Shut it down. Get off the phone with the person that's driving this. That's you. Get off the phone and talk to Jesus. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Shut it down. That lust of the flesh is not going to take you any good place. It's going to take you a wreck. Shut it down. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a choice you have to make, but it's a good one. And until you begin to make that consistently in life, you're never going to grow spiritually. You're never going to grow. You're stalled. You can't win over the flesh. And God's giving you a grace operating asset. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. If you'll trust him, he'll, he'll win, it every, win it every time. He'll beat it every time. That's his job. His job, his job is to control your flesh, to get that out of the way so that you can move on to spiritual things and better things. Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this lesson into our souls. If we just blow it off and move on, talk to ourselves all that foolishness we've talked to ourselves years about and never had any change in our life, needs to come today. Today is the time to have a life-changing experience. Stop walking in the flesh and start walking in the spirit. We're, we're, we're in charge. Volitionally, we have free will. I pray, Father, we would use it wisely. On behalf of Jesus Christ, we've made our prayer. Amen.